Welcome to Speaking of Business. I'm Goldie Hyder of the Business Council of Canada. Today, we're talking about two words, resilience and recovery. For weeks now, we've seen businesses across the country show incredible resilience as they have stepped up to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, changing the ways they operate and helping those in need during this challenging time. But business leaders are also focused on recovery. How can we coexist with this virus? How do we get the economy moving again? And how can we learn from this crisis in order to build back better? These are all great questions for my guest today. Al Monaco is president and CEO of Enbridge. The Calgary-based energy company operates throughout North America, employing 13,000 people. Welcome to the podcast, Al. Thanks, Goldie. Appreciate you having me on. Well, look, let's jump right in. I mean, as my intro said, these are extraordinary times and we're all kind of learning how to cope and adapt to these circumstances. I'm going to ask you that quintessential consulting question. What's keeping you up at night? (laughs) Well, that's a good way to start. You know, you said extraordinary and I think that's uh, right on the mark. And, you know, our response to this, I think, has been driven by the uniqueness of the situation. I mean, if you think about it, and you know this well, Goldie, we've had this triple whammy here, massive social, economic, and business impact. And the scale here has been global. And what's different is the speed by which the game has changed. Normally, we get forewarnings uh, of deep recessions and the like, but not this time around. It, It came up on us quick. You know, our approach here has basically been to stick to the plan, but there's no doubt that we took some immediate action on, let's call it high priority issues. So we got into crisis management mode very quickly. And unfortunately, we're experienced at at managing all kinds of crises in that we are industrial company. But this time around, the action around crisis was around protecting health. That was first and foremost, making sure that we kept the business running and we're an essential service. Energy is critical to the economy and our front lines are also critical to all of that. So we, we went through that. We did a lot of scenario planning within that crisis management mode around people, operations and financial aspects. And we set out these 60, 90, 120 day plans. So that I think worked quite well. What's keeping me up to get to your question is as an industrial company, I'm always worried at night uh, when I wake up about safety and environmental incidents that can affect the public. That's always number one. In this case, I would say the health of our frontline people, definitely the risks around re-entry and as well the mental health of all the people in the organization. And maybe another one I'll add in there in the same breath is the economic outlook and just the depth of this depression. So and I don't mean to imply that I'm awake all night, but certainly those are the those are the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting much sleep at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, why don't we why don't we uh, uh, let's just talk a little bit about the health side of this, uh, because as you've noted, you know, uh, in the rest of the country, for the most part, this is a health emergency. But in Alberta, you've got the health and the economic crisis at the same time on the health stuff. What are you doing? What have you been able to do? to keep your employees safe, specific to the virus challenges, right? In terms of PPEs, tracking, testing, how are you managing? Right. Well, all of the things that uh, other companies are doing, uh, I'm sure, as well around PPE and social distancing. You know, for us, I would say the biggest thing has been, as I mentioned earlier, the front lines. We have uh, control centers, emergency response units, field people, setting up protocols to keep these aspects of our business running was crucial. And in particular, the control centers, I'll just mention, Goldie, you can think about, you know, a room full of people. I'm talking about probably 125 per shift that are monitoring each station and each remote access point along our entire system. And they're the eyes and ears of the company on what's happening out there. And without them, we really can't operate the system safely. So making sure they were protected 
including some contingency plans uh, around, you know, what if, uh, you know, some of them were ill, how do we backfill? We had uh, separate uh, centers uh, for different groups to occupy at different times, depending on what the outcome was at the time. So uh, really focused on the front line and making sure that we could run, aside from the normal uh, health things that we were doing, obviously, we put everybody back into their home office very, very early on, actually, probably one of the first. We moved to that very quickly, and thank goodness for great IT support, which basically uh, made it seamless. And you think about all those people getting on a system at one time, and everybody in the city and the country is doing it at the same time. I think it was a great outcome and a great demonstration of uh, the technology capability. Now, some have suggested that the virus has acted as a disruptor to accelerate change in corporations. Has that happened at Enbridge? You know, I would say that we're always thinking about that, like particularly with respect to how people work in home offices in particular. But I would say, you know, the key for us is to make sure that we're keeping our eye on the long-term ball while managing these, let's call them short-term issues. And what I mean by that is when we looked at the business uh, immediately and, and through our scenario planning, we said, look, what do we need to do here to make sure that we protect against the uncertainty? Everybody was very uncertain about the length of the COVID issue, whether or not we would get a vaccine and how we would position to reopen. So we took kind of a two-step approach. We said, look, we don't know what's going to happen or what the timing is going to be. So let's demonstrate first some near-term what we call bolstering actions to protect against that uncertainty. So what does that mean? Preserve capital. And we got a very strong balance sheet, but I think at the time we said, you know, let's make sure that we preserve as much capital as we can. Let's get the costs because we don't know what the next two, three years are going to look like on growth. So, you know, let's attack the cost line where we can without affecting safety or health. And then another one was actually liquidity. Again, very strong balance sheet and lots of good access to capital, but we didn't know whether or not the capital markets were were going to be shut down. So we got some excess liquidity that would basically allow us to keep our programs going for a year or two without even accessing any uh, refinancing in the capital markets. The next part of it, though, was more driven by the longer term. We asked ourselves, look, is this going to change the world here as far as energy consumption? And we always look at supply demand and demand fundamentals and concluded that, look, you know, that's still intact. The basic proposition around demand and supply for energy is intact because we know the population is going to grow by at least 2 billion people in the next two decades. We're going to have more and more urbanization. That's a fact. And there's going to be a growing middle class, and that's going to still require a heck of a lot of energy. And so when you're dealing with these short-term issues and these priorities that pop up from a from an event like COVID, you've got to come back and say, look, we've got to keep the long term in mind as well and really maintain our optionality to grow the business. And we're lucky that we have so many avenues from which to grow uh, going forward. So that's how we approached uh, the overall uh, issue. Well, look, that's a lot of valuable insight there in terms of business continuity and thinking both short to long term. You know, one of the things it said is all politics is local, but I think you know and I know that so too is all business. And when it comes to Enbridge, you're really plugged in and tapped into the communities and the countries in which you operate. What are you finding on the customer side and how are you helping and from a community perspective, uh, you know, those who have been really harmed by this virus? Oh, yeah. I'm really glad you asked that one on the community. Um, I have to say, Goldie, you know, out of the many things that, you know, we think we do for society anyway, not not everybody agrees all the time, but we are especially proud of how we interact with our communities. And as I mentioned earlier, We've got a lot of experience with this kind of thing. You know, the Houston floods, the Calgary floods, uh, Fort McMurray wildfires, Katrina, and, you know, things that have gone on in Ontario around flooding as well. So in each one of those cases, our first one or two thoughts were, what does it mean to our community? And we're a little bit unique here because 
of the way we engage the communities. And it's driven by the fact that we have thousands of miles of right of way, which means that we're in uh, hundreds and hundreds of communities and our people live in those communities that they work in all along these thousands of miles. So for us, we always look at immediate responses. Okay, what's the most applicable for us? And we've always found that it's generally, you know, food banks, helping first responders, helping uh, healthcare workers. And that, that was really applicable here. We made the decision, I would say, within the first week that we were going to allocate additional funding to our community efforts. So we reached out to roughly 300 organizations focused on those areas I mentioned earlier. We also had a, a very strong drive on emergency funding for Indigenous groups. Uh, about 150 or so Indigenous groups received funding from us right off the bat. And uh, lots of good stories uh, around this. I could go on and on. I like the one about um, uh, one of the First Nations communities um, making face masks. And uh, so we purchased a bunch of those and, and donated them to, to the communities. And, and it's a good example of, of how we can work with Indigenous communities well. You hear so many stories and see so much media about uh, how projects are being opposed, but there's a lot of great stories uh, around our communities as well. Certainly, our listeners have heard it on our podcast, and you've just added yeah. to it with some great examples. And thank you for your leadership and Enbridge's leadership in this regard. Let me pivot, if I can, to the future. Okay. Uh, let's look ahead to the, to the recovery from this pandemic. You know, you and I have had many conversations about our love of Canada, the things we do great, but we've also talked about some of the things that frustrate us. What lessons do you think we can learn as Canadians coming out of this? And how will that help us build back better? Okay, well, uh, again, an excellent question, Goldie. You know, I think that the one item that's really come out of this for me, and I know a lot of other people, is how the COVID issue has elevated energy's role in our society. And let's just think about what happened just about right off the mark when governments named what we do as basically a pipeline utility company as an essential service. And they recognized right away, we've got to keep this part of what we do going. If you think about what you heard on the news just about every night, you know, fighting the pandemic, PPE, ventilators, respirators, gloves, testing kits, all of that in its entirety requires energy in one form or another. If you think about what kept our economy going to the extent it was and kept everybody, you know, safe and healthy in their homes was supply chains. So whether it's uh, trains and or shipping or trucking or anything in that order where you're talking about supply chain, restocking, delivering, again, energy plays a critical role there. So as we think about recovering and the role that we can play to help the economy, um, you know, the, the traditional things that we think about is energy for the most part, is an essential building block to the other sectors. So think about any sector out there when you think about recovery. What they need is available, low-cost, and reliable energy. That's the first building block. I would say that our industry is a globally competitive one on energy, and we're an export economy. So obviously what we do improves the balance of trade. Getting sort of down more to the, I guess, the nitty gritty of, of how we can play a role, it's new investments in infrastructure, you know, shovel ready projects that, that have very high skilled and well paying jobs, not just in Alberta, but across North America and obviously across Canada. People think about the spin off effects of, of, of sectors. Uh, energy is not just an Alberta sector, it has huge spin offs across uh, the country country, Ontario, and Eastern Canada. And I would say, and this is where, you know, you probably 
get disagreement uh, across Canada, and we may get into this, I don't know if you have another question on it, but we feel in the energy space, and I, and I think I've been around long enough to know all of the all of the people within it that sort of drive the largest enterprises, the industry is aligned with the country's goals and the government's goals around climate and, and the things we need to do to reduce energy intensity and, and how we see ourselves as part of that solution. So those are the kinds of things and roles that I think we can play, but we do need to certainly get on the, on the same page on it. Yeah, well, you, you read my mind because my next question was exactly that. As you know, we're now speaking on the end of May here, but last month, the Business Council of Canada was scheduled to have a meeting in Calgary uh, to discuss very specifically the reconciliation of the environment and the economy, what we call sort of clean growth 2.0, where we wanted to look at, uh, you know, how do you get to the 2030 targets and how do you build, build a, a, a plan and a path forward to net zero by 2050? Uh how do we do that? And how is this virus perhaps going to change that conversation when we get back to it? Because let's be honest, we all need to get back to that conversation so we can make the progress that you've just outlined. Yeah. Well, you know, the the, the meeting in Calgary, we're, we were all looking forward to. And did you promise, by the way, that you would have it in Calgary uh, again pretty soon? We'll be back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll be back. You know I'm Calgarian, right? That's a loaded yeah, question to yeah, a Calgarian. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, um let, let me start this way, and I don't know if this is what you want to hear, but uh, the reality is we do not have a common view of energy's role in Canada yet. I think we are still debating the future of energy and whether conventional energy is needed at all. And I think in order to move forward, we're going to have to acknowledge that uh, one way or the other, that energy is or isn't foundational to the growth of this country and identify the role that we want energy to play so that we can provide the policy clarity to attract investment going forward. So, you know, that's my that's my overall balanced view on this, but if you step back now and you and you think about what we need to do, what are our strengths in this country? So, it's it's basically an export economy, that's good. I would say that we have unmatched, and you can check uh, the facts on this one, environmental and regulatory processes in this country. We've got an industry that is at the forefront of emissions intensity reduction. Our approach, despite you know the headline sometimes, our approach to indigenous engagement is second to none. We've got huge support from you know most every community along the right of way when we and we've built our expertise in this by the way over a long period of time and some mistakes the workforce in this country highly educated we are the furthest ahead at least maybe the first second or third globally in terms of energy technology and we've got great capital markets to facilitate investment when we've got that framework. So if you look at the strengths, I, I think Canada is an, is an excellent position here. The issue is, and I know people have talked about a national energy strategy in one form or another, but that's definitely what we need. We need one that reconciles economic uh, environment and energy issues in this country. And, you know, if if I could say one thing, it's we need to recognize that the energy industry has got to be part of the solution. And I think it can lead the transition to a lower carbon economy. And when governments and industry actually sit down together and work on a common problem like we have around COVID, I think uh, it can work extremely well. The centerpiece, though, Goldie, I mean, You'll have your thoughts on this too, but to me, the marrying up of a, a low carbon industrial strategy that combines with our climate goals and our export strengths, I think that's where the key is in terms of the future of energy and how we align it with the other priorities we have. So think about exporting of lower emissions intensity energy. Natural gas is the best example where we can displace 
coal that's being used elsewhere globally. We're exporting our our low carbon capability there. We know that that's going to have hopefully broad appeal to regions, environmental leaders, and indigenous groups. And we've got a lot of great examples. I mentioned the energy industry is is lowered its intensity 28% over the last decade on an intensity basis. And you know that several companies have already talked about reaching for net zero by 2000. 2050. But it's not just energy. Auto has also uh, done a good job in reducing emissions. And then, you know, aluminum and coal uh, in Canada have, have less embedded carbon and then other parts of the world. So I really think that we've got a tremendous opportunity here if we can get on the same page and, and reconcile those three elements. Well, I think you said it best. I mean, when business and government work together, we can get some good stuff down. Look at the response from industry on PPE shortages, for example. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I can't add anything to what you said. I will just say that it's also an extremely innovative industry. And I don't think enough credit's given to the industry for the innovation that takes place that helps address climate change. And secondly, I would say when you're running a $300 billion deficit and soon trillion dollar debt, <laughs> You're going to need a large part of your energy sector to be humming in order to be help paying some of that back, aren't you? Yeah. And you know what? I can't tell you today whether COVID is going to be the, you know, the the, the pivot point, if you will, to people mm-hmm. sort of recognizing the power of what a very strong energy business can do. Uh, but I think all the elements are there, and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we can come around to this because it really is quite a powerful piece of an economy, and particularly when Canada has so many strengths uh, already, and, and we're just endowed with so many positives uh, on the energy front. Well, that's uh, probably a great place to stop, but I do want to sneak in one final question. And this is really, really because of, of the fact that, you know, as you noted, you're a leader that's been through a lot of crises, but this one's got to be different. And I want to know, what are you personally seeing and learning about yourself as a leader uh, as you navigate this crisis? You know, I've thought about this a little bit and um, having been in my home office here for the last uh, two and a half months, you, you tend to think about things like that. For sure, the thing that struck me mostly is the absolute criticality and importance of being close to your, your people and uh, particularly when they are so affected by what's happening out there. I mean, you know, they're worried about their families. They're, you know, whether it's parental care, child care, or just working in a home together uh, when normally that that is not the case. So I think we've we've really seen a lot on that front, and I've been moved by how well our company and our people have responded. Uh, we've tried to do quite a bit in terms of um, you know over communicating with them, if I can put it that way. We have frequent uh, check-ins with the team. One of the things that that I found. Uh, very helpful was actually personally recognizing the front lines and having one-on-one conversations with the person in the control center or with the person that's got to dispatch work, uh, even though they've got their own family crisis to worry about. Um, One of the most inspirational uh, things that I've seen in the last two months was a video I received uh, yesterday morning which was a video of uh, a longtime employee in our Houston office. And that employee, after n- a nine week battle with COVID on and, and off the ventilator, uh, was released from hospital yesterday morning. We had a video of that. And so we're going to share that around the company. Uh, but it just, it just made me feel great that. Uh, the person was uh, was being wheeled out of the hospital, and uh, it was just a great rallying point uh, for the rest of the company. It was, as I said, one of the best things I've seen in a long time. I think another aspect of this, which we watched very closely, frankly, was mental health. And I think you've heard a lot about that uh, recently in the news and, and, and by other commentators about uh, how you've got to watch that and really make sure that people have access to to help. So I think that's probably the one thing is is the absolute criticality of having people, uh, you know, on the same page and really helping each other through a crisis like this. 
Al, I can't thank you enough for doing this. A lot of content there for our listeners to absorb. We really appreciate you making the time. Okay, Goldie, thank you for having us and uh, we'll hopefully we'll chat soon. Al Monaco is president and CEO of Enbridge. If you would like to hear more of our Speaking of Business conversations about the COVID-19 crisis, you can find them all wherever you get your podcasts or simply go to our website, speakingofbiz.ca. That's biz with a Z. Until next time, I'm Goldie Hyder. Thanks for joining us. Be well.